Hello and welcome to the Monday, February 11th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and I am recording from Jacksonville, Florida. The way most phishing sites work is that an attacker sets up a website, has full access, of course, to the server, uploads files that will emulate the form and will collect the data, pretty much sort of like any website does it, and then store the data on the server and exfiltrate it to the attacker, or even just store it on the server, and the attacker will periodically download. Xavier, however, came across a phishing website that taking a little bit more modern approach to collecting the data. Instead of having actually a scripting language like php.net or whatever, the entire phishing attack is actually implemented in JavaScript. And the JavaScript will collect the data from the victim and then report it to a site that's actually doing all the central collection. Of course, the advantage of this scheme is that if anybody takes down the phishing site, they will be left with very little sort of forensic evidence. They will not recover typically any of the usernames and passwords that users have entered in the phishing site while it was active. They may see based on the web logs how many people sort of visit the site, but that's about all they they would be able to get from this site. Of course, uh, this approach is also much easier to set up, could easily be done on a compromised website. The attacker doesn't really need sort of full access to the site, just needs to be able to get their JavaScript and the HTML form somehow placed on the site. In this particular case, actually, Xavier also found the script that then receives the data that's being collected via JavaScript. And in this case, it's all also just directly emailed to the attacker. And Akamai is reporting about another trick that fishers are using to make their scams more plausible. Now, this one particular targets Google credentials. And the trick the attacker employs here is that instead of directing the victim directly to the phishing page, they are directing the victim to a Google Translate version of the phishing page. You can translate any arbitrary page with Google Translate by essentially just appending the URL you would like to translate to translate.googleuseraccount.com. Well, of course, the user may only look at that first part of the URL, which is a legitimate Google URL, and not notice that the page displayed is actually the page loaded by Google Translate from this other site. Now, Google, of course, is the obvious victim here, but uh, Akamai has observed uh, this particular trick also used to collect Facebook credentials. And Friday, I talked about how Apple released an update for iOS and Mac OS. And the focus, of course, was the FaceTime vulnerability that was addressed in this update. And I mentioned there were also two additional updates that uh, were being rolled out in this patch that fixed vulnerabilities reported by Google's Project Zero. Well, it turns out uh, these vulnerabilities may have actually been more important than the FaceTime vulnerability. The FaceTime vulnerability was, after all, already mitigated by Apple's server side by disabling FaceTime group messages for vulnerable devices. These two additional vulnerabilities were remote code execution vulnerabilities that apparently are already being exploited in the wild in targeted attacks. So this should probably raise the importance and the criticality of this update for you. And a number of popular iOS apps that are available in the Apple App Store and most of them are actually travel related, were found to use the Classbox library. Now, Classbox is a company that specializes in recording users' screens in order to fix and also test usability issues with a particular application. So the idea is that the vendor will be able to record sessions 
of users that are actually using their applications without the user knowing. And then they will be able to use the data to figure out if users run into problems using their application or in general, how are users using the applications? For example, things like what part of the application is used more than other parts. Now, that overall isn't really all that bad necessarily. They can only look at their own application. The problem, however, is that apparently Apparently, Classbox didn't sanitize input fields. So as part of the recording, there were also credit card numbers and other personal data being reported back, not to the company that was responsible for the application, like Air Canada, for example, used it, but to Classbox, which was then collecting and analyzing the data. While this apparently wasn't really done sort of malicious necessarily, it wasn't explained in privacy statements and Apple has revoked these applications for now and they have to be republished without the Classbox API. Well, and this is it for today. So thanks again for everybody who helped promote the podcast for the 10 year anniversary we had this weekend. Also, there is still this weekend's packet channels out there. I think I forgot to actually mention it on Friday. So I'll give you till the end sort of, of Monday till I release the solution. And again, solutions or attempts at solutions will be eligible for the Raspberry Pi draw which will also include additional similar challenges that uh, I'll post over the coming weekends. That's it. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.